Hello all you hardcore boxing fans out there, how are you doing? It's Big P here. You know, don't you? You know, because that's why you've tuned in. Today I'm joined by my good friend from London, Terry. How are you doing, Terry? Mate, I'm good, I'm good. Freezing my nuts off, but I'm good. Well, what do you think to this, Terry? 44, 44 phone calls today from about five different people. All porky haters. Oh, really? Yeah, they tracked me down here. I've had it now, haven't I? <laughs> the thing is, so, so the thing I don't understand, Russ, is <laughs> how sad are these people that they think anyone cares? Like, why are you phoning someone to say what? What do they want to say to you? Because if I remember correctly, your your favourite catchphrase, Russ, is come we'll see, see me. Not, come, not call me, come see well, me. They've got the phone number, they know what address. Yeah, let the, well, no, they might just be sharing it in their silly little groups. You know, their little pally pally groups. Like, you know, you're, you're, they call themselves like triple X hardcore boxing fan. <laughs> <laughs> and they all like to, to laugh with each other, man. These guys who never come to shows, who haven't had a girlfriend since 2001. You know, the normal ones, man. Like, it's. <laughs> And and just before people start saying I'm being cruel, that's not all boxing fans, but there's a yeah. group of people who, and I remember this, Russ, when I was a kid, what, when I was at school, one of my proudest moments was, I was, I was 18 at this point, right? And I walked past this group of kids and they were having a debate about who would win between me and my mate Jody, right? Yeah. And I knew I'd made it in school when, when, they, when, when we were classed as the number one and number two in the whole school. Yeah, and so they were having this debate, and I and I, I couldn't understand why a bunch of year sevens would be wondering who would win between these two. And I saw these, I said, I said, listen, guys, we'll never fight because we're best mates. But that's what these fans are like. They like to live their inadequacies through other people. So that like they hate you, Porks, but I think deep down they love you. Well, I don't know. That's that since last night. I got here this morning. Like, obviously, I've gone through all the messages and. <laughs> Anything interesting? Yeah, we're going to slice me up. <laughs> one of them's going to put me on a spit with an apple in my mouth. Or the other no, one. No, actually, actually, yo, yo, no, no, no. That's quite funny, actually. <laughs> well, trust all up like a turkey, like that apple in my mouth. <laughs> well, mate, oh, but I don't understand this. You do videos on YouTube, right? No one's forced to watch them. So these people, why would you watch a video to get so angry about someone you're going to threaten them? Why not just turn it off? It's serious, isn't it, when they're ringing your place of work up, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, moving on. We've given them a little moment, aren't we? But actually, some of them are quite funny, actually. One of them, one of them uh, I said, well, why is it? Don't watch it. What, what's your problem with Wait, it's just not right. I said, well, you're always digging at the air now. I said, well, I think I've got a reason to dig him out when the product's watered down, isn't it? And they're charging £25 for a watered down product, but yet six or seven years ago, we had better products on non-pay-per-view. Well, well, yeah, but he's still always digging at the out. So anyway, Eddie's set his uh, matchroom FC on me, so keep watching. Keep going, the porky legend. Right, uh, the big news, we'll go straight in with the big news. Uh, Matchroom, Eddie Earns apparently setting up uh, Matchroom, a channel, you know, a channel to put sports on. Uh, you've probably seen the press release, haven't you? Oh, no, so, so, so you got to clear this up for me because I've heard it from a couple of different sources. Yeah. Is he setting up a channel for live sport or is he setting up a channel for Matchroom branded content? You see, this is where it's a bit murky, isn't it? I think it. What well, I think this is what I think because we all know he's a he's a bluffer. He play it's 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 a game of chess now. I think they're setting up a media thing to do documentaries about their fighters to grow them and that to get them because when we're gonna when fans are allowed back, they're gonna have to big these people up. You know, all mm. the all the champions that they've got, they're gonna have to give them airtime so that yeah. they've got a better reputation and they the sold more to public. But I think it's been left in Sky's back of their mind that here, these might be going their own way here. So I think he's trying to force the hand. So I don't think it's 100% that they're going to leave Sky because they've been creaming it there for, uh, since 1995, haven't they? 
since they had you back. Mm -hmm. So that's what I think, but you don't know, dear. But if he is going to set up a channel, I've spoke to people in that industry today, one of the tech guys that, uh, that works with his camera, and he's from TV and film industry, and he says you can easily do £50 million in on anything like that because you can have people sat about all day and it can be a massive investment. But obviously, if they're thinking for future generations and family and all that and building something, yeah, they, they, they could quite easily uh, set it up. They've got enough money, haven't they, to do it? But I, I'd, I this is why I haven't jumped in just yet. I don't think he's left Sky yet. I think he's trying to force the hand because this is what they do. The game players, aren't they? But we'll see. What do you think, Terry? Ah, mm. uh, right. It's complex. I've got an episode about this thing. Porky's dropping tomorrow, so mm. I'm trying not to. I'm, I'm trying not to fucking Jimmy Savile my own comment. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do then. I'll put this. What time's yours going to drop tomorrow? Ah, uh, about midday. Well, I'll drop this tomorrow, two o'clock then. So you can say no, 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 no. Let no, no. Let, let this oh. go first because because I'm not I'm not going to talk for half an hour on your show about match with Emma, so yeah, I can yeah, be yeah. quick. Okay. okay, okay. So let's 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 go back to the first lockdown, Russ. Yeah. What match from content did you watch during the lockdown? I watched Egg nothing really. Eggington really, and uh... no, 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 no. Before boxing came back, between March and July, what did you watch? Nothing, nothing right? Nothing. Eddie knows that. All he had were those silly little Zoom calls he was having with Coogan, which weren't well received, by the way. They weren't well viewed. And so Hearn realised Sky lost out to BT because all BT did is they said to ESPN, can we borrow some of your content? And ESPN said, take whatever you want. So we were all watching BT Sport during the lockdown. And so BT got the advantage. And when boxing came back, we were more inclined to watch BT because they'd looked after us in lockdown. Hearn's not stupid. So Hearn now realises you need that content in case there's no boxing for some reason or other. You need matchroom branded content to keep fans interested in the brand. Eddie's not selling Sky. Eddie's not selling... Eddie's selling matchroom. Yeah. And this is just the evolution in that. Now, that sits independently of the contract with Sky. I think Hearn realises if you own that kind of content, you can sell it back to Sky. Sky aren't going to do that. So yeah. you can sell that content back to Sky. Now, with the negotiations for Sky, remember the last two contracts they did, Porky, they did with Barney Francis, right? Yeah. And Barney Francis is, if I remember correctly, he's a product guy. He's a content guy because he did, did he do the 2020 cricket and all that sort of stuff? That's yeah. what he's famous yeah. for in Sky. They've got the new guy now, Rob Webster, who's yeah. not a product guy. Rob Webster's, uh, my mate was telling me he used to be commercial director at Sky. So Rob Webster's about money. So Hearn can talk about, we need to be exclusive so we can make these fights. Rob Webster doesn't care because he knows what he wants to do. So he'll look at it from a commercial perspective. And also, wasn't Barney Francis non-exec director at Matchroom? Yeah. So you can see that the Hearns had a strong position when they were negotiating before. But now they've got this Rob Webster guy who's a lawyer by trade, so he's not necessarily a boxing guy or a content guy, he's a lawyer by trade. The numbers all have to make sense. The terms have to work for Sky. That's what he's going to be doing. So I imagine that Rob Webster said, we can do the deal, but either you have to be 100% exclusive to us and we're 100% exclusive to you, or we open up our platform to others like you've opened yourself up to others. Yeah, And I think that's where the, the toing and froing is happening. To what extent can Sky work with other people? Because I think the appetite is to work with other people. Because, like I said, from a commercial perspective, why do I want to watch Eggington versus whoever when I could put some other fight on, which is probably more interesting? Wow. You know, maybe, yeah, yeah. yeah, maybe Goodwin's got something in his locker that's of value and we can find a way to get him on a platform. Do you see what I mean? And hopefully Rob Webster sees Sky Sports as a platform. Yeah. And so... Hearn then loses power. So I think that's where the game's being played here. It's that how much exclusivity does each side give to the other? Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see how it pans out, isn't it, in coming months? So, the, the, look, ideally you want to stay with Hearn because you have a working model that works. 
but it doesn't work 100% of the time. So what will Rob Webster do? Will he say, we have to approve all the cards? And then if so, who does that? Quality it control. Even, yeah, it might not even be an Adam Smith. It might not even be an Ed Robinson. It might be someone yeah. that Rob Webster trusts. You know what I mean? You, you could put your, your hat in the, in the ring for that. So he might say, look, we want to approve all the cards. Well, Ed Robinson does that now, doesn't he? Ed Robinson. He's the quality yeah. control guy. Mm, I think he's just more the... It's tricky with Ed. Like Ed, Ed, Ed's been in the game so long. People forget this that he's got a load of different roles, official and unofficial. So, I think in the old world of the Barney Francis world of the we're all boxing fans world, yeah, Ed had influence. I don't know what happens now because Russ, it's like you. If you took over Sky now, Sky Sports, Russ, you're going to get your mates in, right? Mm. And you're going to trust their opinion. You're not going to trust whoever's been there before. You're going to be like, no, no, no. I trust my people. So let's just see what happens because Rob hasn't been in the job that long. So let's see how these negotiations go. Yeah, it's going to be interesting, isn't it, Terry? All right, then. Uh, where do you see if Sky let Matchroom go or they bring other people in to share the dates, right? What's going to happen to the, the Bean Masons? Some will stay, some will go. Do you think that's what will happen, yeah? Yeah, I think I think if if there's a radical change in approach, some will stay, some will go. Because let's say the Sowlands get to do a show. The Sowlands will have their people they want to have on commentary. Yeah. So it would just be... Yeah, and because these guys aren't on salaries, you can just bring them in and out as you want. So it just means less work for a lot of these guys. All right, then. All right, then, moving on. Uh... And cross that off then. There you go. Uh, Joe Fournier did an interview in two and a half hours, 10,219 views, only 49 comments. I think you might be right, Terry. They might be cheating. Joe Fournier. So, so I know Joe. And talking, about, know. talking about him fighting Logan Paul and... YouTube this and exhibition that and and then it's done over ten thousand views in two and a half hours. Joshua doesn't even do that, but on Coogan's average for that, you've got about two hundred and fifty comments. So where's the other two hundred comments? I don't get that. It works out at ninety nine point five one percent of people didn't comment. I get. 175 comments on a third of that on view. So they're going to be cheating, aren't they? Surely to God. Um, I, look, I think those numbers are cooked. I've said it before, I'll say it again. I think the numbers are cooked. And I think it could be Coogan. It could be the guys behind Fournier. It could be the guys behind whoever, right? Because anyone can buy views. I could buy a million views for Coogan's platform now just to disrupt his business. I could easily do that every day, just buy a million views. And in the end, YouTube will suspend his account for irregular behavior. That's, yeah, that's one way you can... That's how you can bring a channel down. If you just want to just flood it with, with bots, you just bring it down. But yeah, you're right. Like, no one knows who Joe Fournier is, by the way. Nobody knows. Unless... Look, I know Joe Fournier because obviously I spent, like, what, nearly three years with David? So I know Joe Fournier because he was affiliated to that and I think he's putting a few quid into David as well. So that's how I know Fournier. And I don't mind Joe one way or the other. Joe's all right. He never did me any wrong. But is he strikes me as a guy who's trying to buy credibility in boxing and you can't do yeah. that. Like if, if you really want to do this thing, cool, Joe, but you're a guy in your 40s now. You're not really a contender. You never really were. You didn't fight anyone that we could recognise. So... I do. I refuse to believe ten thousand people know who Joe Fournier is to show an interest, and I refuse to believe people clicked on it because it had one of the Paul brothers in there. And this is what I mean about the boxing being a con. Let me give you an interesting one, Russ. Yeah. Right? I don't know if you ever looked at the Matchroom subscriber figures, but there was a point last year during the lockdown where the monthly figures went five thousand. 5,000, 
7,000, 6,000, 5,000. All round numbers, numbers of followers, all round numbers. And I'm not making this up. You can go on like Social Geek or whatever it is yeah. and you can check. Yeah. It's 5,000, 5,000, 6,000, 6,000. What are the odds that five months in a row you get round numbers of supporters? What are those odds? Crazy, isn't it? It's just a thousand, 10,000 to one. So, so, so I will say for certain, match you were buying subscribers. Yeah. And if match you were buying subscribers, why wouldn't IFL be buying subscribers? Yeah. So so I'm I'm sold on the fact that this is there's a form of social media doping happening. And oh, you can check the numbers. And, yeah, and anyone that wants to call me and say I'm wrong, I check the numbers. Right? And then the other thing I found quite sinister as well, have you noticed that S Jam Boxing, so Sam Jones's boxing thing, is now sponsoring behind the gloves? Are they? Oh, right. Yeah. Right. So, so what does that mean for objectivity then? So that means that behind the gloves... Are going to give exclusive content to Joe Joyce and Sam Jones as fighters. Maybe, yeah. So, so, we, so we're, ent we're entering this really interesting phase for all of these guys because where's the money coming from? Are they making a living off this? Is it lucrative enough to make a living? Because remember, Rob Tebbett had his little meltdown about Tunde, and he's been really quiet since, if you notice. Tebbett's just not really done much and I think it's it's dawned on him that he will never make a fortune doing boxing content so now he's doing other stuff he's talking to actors have you seen that yeah oh, oh Rob <laughs> Chabot is he's talking yeah, to he's, actors he's got his little he's got his new little channel where he talks to to actors we don't even know about <laughs> what in, 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 in a boxing bloke no more I think he still is but he's realized mate that's not gonna that's not gonna that's definitely not going to put Cheerios on the table. Do you know what I mean? There's no money so, in this. Yeah. There's no money in this. You've got to do it as an hobby. <laughs> if you get lucky, you get lucky. You've got to do it as a yeah. hobby. Yeah. Or, or you find someone to sponsor it. But I think last year in that lockdown, people realised that the sponsorship wasn't doing anything. Like their numbers weren't changing. So everyone's kind of scaled back. Because remember, it used to be William Hill sponsoring IFL, right? We don't know. Now it's like, what, Debt KO? Who the hell is fucking Debt KO? I don't know. Are you, it's, uh, are you having sleepless nights or something? It says... <laughs> <laughs> look, 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 look. The advert was so cheap, they had to get Coogan to do the voiceover. They couldn't afford to get a proper voiceover. They just said, mate, we're going to sponsor you, but you got to do the voiceover. <laughs> Poor Coogan. Poor Coogan is going to be a dad, you know. Isn't he already a dad? No, five week. Coogan's going to be a dad. Coogan, my advice to you, Coogan, is this. When I had my twins, I ordered a pallet, right, and nappies. A pallet, a nappies, and wipes. It came on a pallet. Well, oh, my God, I had to put them all in my shed. So you're going to need loads of nappies, Coogan, and loads of wipes. Good luck to you, mate. But try and do it with twins, because that's really hard. Not one, baby. Try doing it with two. But uh, I thought Coogan were a Jaffa, so he's, he ended up a man, so good luck to him. But so basically, the doping out there. So Rob Tebbett's not the hardcore's hardcore no more. He's the voice of EastEnders, is he? Mate, he never was the hardcore's hardcore. Uh, people bought into this because he asked a couple of really boring questions in a kind of fake <laughs> middle class accent. Oh, you, you always hammer Rob, don't you? <laughs> no, 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 Russ. I, I, I hammer people who don't have integrity. You know that. That's why I have yeah. He has no integrity. Like, he made a lot of promises that he never kept. And he does that a lot. There are a lot of people in boxing that don't like Rob Tebbett. That's why they don't go on his channel. Yeah. Uh, poor Rob. Has he still got a beard? I don't even care, man. I, you know, what, what's he going to do? Sell it for... <laughs> sell it for nappies. <laughs> Poor Rob. All right, then. Well, we'll cross Joe Fournier one off. That's done. Uh, can I just point out that Joe Fournier kept putting himself into the mix to fight Logan Paul, didn't he? Or Jake Paul, whichever one it were. I get them mixed up. And do you think that... Oh, another thing. Is it true Leonard Ellaby went to Joe Fournier to put the money up for Mayweather versus Logan Paul? Is that true? Nah, Fournier what? doesn't have that kind of money. 
Well, that's what he said, didn't he, on his interview? That nah, Fournier does not have that kind of money. Well, why is he down as on the jo- on the title of Coogan's videos as billionaire Joe Fournier? He's not that wealthy. Like I've seen him up close. He's he's one of those guys who's got a few quid, right? Bit but like, he pretends he like has more. Be like Dennis. No, 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 no. Look, I've seen like Dennis. I think in, in Forbes magazine they've got Dennis number seventy-two of the world's billionaires. Oh yeah. Yeah. And what's he a tax exile for then if he's got all that money? <laughs> well, he's not a tax. He's, listen, he's not a tax exile. He likes Jersey. That's really all there is to it. And Cayman Islands. <laughs> yeah. No, nah, look, look. He likes, he like, he likes the, the choice of restaurants there. The, you know what I mean? Good whiskey selection. He likes it. Good kettle crisps. <laughs> <laughs> all right, then. Uh, so we've covered Joe Forney and the logo, Paul. Lewis Richardson. Left Neil Fano said he's homesick. The rumour is he's gone back to his dad, but I've also heard that people are saying that he's going to go with a recommended trainer. What's Ritz's, what's Ritz's favourite punch? Right hook, isn't it? No, no, no boxer's favourite punch is a right hook, Porky. It's oh, too wow. risky. It's the left hook. Ritson's favourite punch is the left hook. Oh, he's right handed, What's don't be- he? Mm, but he boxes orthodox, right? Yeah. What's Bellew's favourite punch? Left hook. You can start to see where this is going, can't you? Dylan White, left hook. Mm. So you can see where this is going. It's definitely headed somewhere. It's, it's headed somewhere near Rotherham, I imagine. Oh, Penfold. Mm. You know, if Dave Caldwell ends up with Lewis Ritson, we might as well pack up and go home, aren't we? We might as well. I don't, no, 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 no. So, so let's let's be absolutely clear about who Ritson is. Ritson is not Josh Taylor, right? Ritson's like Ritson's Sean Masher Dodd plus ten percent. That's what he is. Now, no matter what what Adam Smith had you believing, Porky. No matter what Johnny Nelson had you believing, Ritson isn't a guy who should be fighting for a world title. That's the start and end of it. So so he's perfectly suited to someone like Caldwell because Caldwell's not really designed for those world championship fights. And that's something I'd say to Dave if I saw him personally. I don't think Dave is a trainer of world champions, not on a consistent basis anyway. He's a good trainer, though, isn't he, Caldwell? We have to give him some credit, don't we? Really? Really? Uh, from, 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 from the man who video after video <laughs> video after video, who is he taking from debut to world champion? I always, yeah, Dave don't come see me, I'm frightened to death for you. I'm feeling me nappy. <laughs> yeah, so I think I think, I think Caldwell, look for, for those middle of the road match from fighters, Caldwell's perfect. He, he's competent enough. He's got his own facility. He's got a couple of people on the way up. But I just think when a boxer tells you he's homesick, he hasn't got the minerals to be a world champion. You can't be homesick. Like, if it's really the thing that's most important to you, which it should be, you can't be homesick. I mean, you can't be... Nah, you just can't. Sorry. You know, you can't. Yeah. Well, he's only at Hartley Pool, and he's from Newcastle, isn't he? So I'm I'm a bit disappointed, and I like Fano, and Fano is one of them people. They're not going to creep around Eddie Earn and all that, and they just they just do their own thing. They're old school, mate. You know, I like Neil Fano, and I think it's a shame they've split up. I thought they look really tight in that there. So nothing's ever tight in boxing, mate. Boxing things are either convenient or not convenient. That's it. Oh. All right, then. Uh, we wish Lewis Ritson well. He's a nice kid. Dana White. Dana White has put on, in the next eight week. he has got out his 11 world champions. Seven of them are going to fight. And uh, the, they're all, and the other two that are not world champions, they're fighting number one ranked and number two ranked. And the other two that are on the cards, they're former champions getting at it. 
do we, do we see a pattern where UFC don't say we need to build it up down the line and big this fight up? They just get at it, don't they? And boxing, we always feel shortchanged as fans, Terry. Do you tend to agree with that? The, the fights we want, we're always like waiting ages, like Manny Pacquiao, Mayweather, Hatton, Mayweather, uh, you know, f uh, f things like that. Whereas when Frotch were about, he fought Groves next after the first one, didn't he? And everybody just fought, didn't well, they? Well, he didn't want to. Wait, wait, no, no, he didn't want to. No, he did. He did. They just had to build it up, he told me. No, nah, whatever. No, no, no. No, just, you know, just look at that picture in front of you, Paul. What picture? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, listen, this is what he did to cut. This is what he did to him. Look at Groves. What, what did what? Groves is on the floor. No, no, but look at that. No, no, go back to that picture, Russ. Look at it, right? Look at that bit of water by Groves' ankle that they didn't talk about that McCracken left there deliberately. So he <laughs> slipped. Yo, man. Yeah, he slipped, banged his head on the ring, and then that was it. Like, I, I, there should have been another fight after that. Rosie boy got took out, mate, twice. No, nah, don't, nah, don't, listen, that never happened. <laughs> so, <laughs> do you feel that UFC no. are leading the way forward with how matches uh, uh, and combat sports uh, uh, should be made? Okay, so let's, let, let's look at UFC for what it really is, right? UFC is a company that's loaded by about two point something billion worth of debt. That's money that needs to be paid back every month, Russ. How do you know so all this? Well, they make the deal public, right? Yeah. So when the UFC was bought out, I think it was four point two billion. Yeah, go on. Um, yeah. yeah. So 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 the UFC was bought out for four point two billion. That's money that no one really wants to spend on the UFC. So you borrow that money and you pay back against your future receipts. That's why Dana White had to go to Fight Island. That's why Dana White couldn't wait as long as Eddie Hearn. Because he was like, we need to go as soon as possible because we've got debt payments and interest payments that come every month. So Dana White can't wait five years for his big fights to happen. He has to make them happen now. Whereas in boxing, think about this, right? If Frank Warren doesn't put on a fight, he only has to pay the wages of the people in the office. And a lot of those are freelance anyway. Yeah. That's the difference. If, if Frank had to pay his fighters every month, you'd be seeing the big fights happen. But give Frank his due. He put Yard and Arthur in. He put Joyce and Dubois in. So we can't criticise Frank for that. The fans the fans got what they wanted out of Frank's stable. They didn't get last what they year. wanted out of Eddie Hearn's stable last year, did they? No, they didn't. Because, because deep down, Hearn doesn't have that much pull over his fighters. Mm. He doesn't. Yeah. Oh, I'd love to make... I remember, what was it? I'd all these fights he'd love to make, and he always talks about that, but people just don't take his calls. Canelo just saw Smith as an easy few quid. He's ah, like, I'll just do this now, keep the zone happy, get rid of Oscar. Then he's going to fight Yildrim, and Hearns sort of stuck his nose in on that. And then he'll probably fight Billy Joe in May. And then what's Hearn going to do? Dig up John Ryder and go, well, yeah, we can put him in with John Ryder. After that, he's done with Hearn. And then you've got to go after guys like Benavides and Caleb Plant. Yeah. So Hearn hasn't got the pull to give us those kinds of fights. Yeah. That's, that, that's just the harsh reality of it. And he's not good at building up talent so that there's a pipeline coming through regularly. He's just... This thing called boxing, Hearn has realised he's good at being Hearn and really bad at being a boxing promoter. Mm. All right, then. Moving on from the UFC uh, showing boxing how fights should be made. Gavin McDonald's uh, signed with MTK uh, in an advisory role. What do you think to that? Well, he's going to be advising people. No, MT friend of ours has just sent us this. Uh, have a look. MTK Global is delighted to announce an advisory deal with two-time world challenger Team Gav Mark. Big twinny Gav. So, what do you think about that? Is that good for Gavin or is he washed up? Don't care. He was never relevant. Don't really care about the McDonald's. Park him. Park him. Boxes move past them. Don't really care. They 
they were never people who who struck me as being dedicated and people used to praise them ah oh, they they kept their jobs as plasterers whatever it is they were doing ah oh, isn't that noble but they kept everything else up the boozing and the drugs apparently so what sympathy can you have for these people russ well speaking as a former drug addict uh I can sympathise with them, but as regards their fighters, aren't they? They shouldn't be part of yeah. it. Listen, if you, know? you if you wanna if you wanna do stuff, fine, by all means do it. But the drug stuff, like where's UCAD? They must know. Well, what you tell me UCAD didn't test these guys and go, well, why have you got this residue in you? Do you know what I mean? The only time I felt sorry for Jamie McDonald, actually there's probably a couple of times. Remember in America he struggled to make weight. Yeah. And that was with Dave. Japan. Struggled to make weight. And then Dave took them on a little jolly to Dubai, if you remember. Yeah. And that's when I felt sorry. Yeah, I felt sorry for him there. Yeah. Mm. And they tried to make him do those sort of UFC weight cuts, where they were just, it was just so savage. And the new age just went, ah, mate, you want to play that game? Good night. Mm. Yeah. uh, I felt sorry for... uh, them, to be honest, mate, I, f- I felt really, really sorry for him. Uh, when, Why? When it, I, felt, I felt sorry for Jamie when he got beat in Japan because Jamie's five foot ten and a half, isn't he? Right? Which is the same height as Mike Tyson. And Jamie's doing eight, what, well, eight, under an 18 pound. He's half the yeah. man Mike Tyson were. And he, he looked like a skeleton. And they had to carry him onto the scales, didn't they, in Japan? So I think that's a bit sad, but. Hopefully, the other one, Big Twinny Gav, uh, who's got a win over Josh Whale, which I didn't agree with. The other one would have draw, but Josh what B-side, won he? But I think that Big Twinny Gav, if he's going to come back, that's brilliant. I'd like to see him fight Josh Whale, and maybe they might have a trilogy. We don't know, do we? We're going to see, aren't we? I, I have zero interest in that fight. Zero. Why not? Zero. Yeah, but for local Zero. People, Round here, local people that want to watch you, aren't they? Yeah, I bet any money they wouldn't. Mate, that's like, that's like saying to me, do I want to drive a K-Reg box or Cavalier? No. Hey, I used to have a Cavalier. Cavalier Commando on a 1985 B-plate. We're about six years old. <laughs> <laughs> Cavalier Commando 1.8. <clears throat> Four speed. Oh, living life. Now, no, no, listen, no one cares, man. I don't even think people in South Yorkshire care about Whale versus McDonald. It doesn't mean anything. Those guys, listen, boxing is this, ch- you get a really small window in boxing to make yourself relevant to the British public. Yeah. And once you miss that window, the public will not care about you. Once you hit that window, they'll never forget you. That's yeah. why Dave Allen keeps making these these noises about coming back if the money's right because he knows the public won't forget him yeah what do you think about dave allen coming out with saying that he would offer forty thousand to fight in south africa in an exhibition do you think that's dave inserting himself into that it that that sort of uh concept to say yeah i will do exhibitions do you think it really happened or do you think it's pony <laughs> To fight who in South Africa? Who knows he Dave Allen in South he did, Africa? He didn't say, he didn't say. Who knows who Dave Allen is to be he paying said. him 40 grand? Plus plus the hotel costs for two weeks in quarantine and then fight. Nah, Dave, come on, man. Nah. <laughs> Eddie, any pay you 40 grand tomorrow, man. Don't worry about that. What do you think about Dave Allen managing uh, six or seven fighters and giving them advice? This is from a man who never trained, never ate right, never lived a life, and never even moved his head in ring. Do you think he'll learn from his mistakes and pass it on, or do you think it's just for him to stay relevant? Mm. It's all about the grift, isn't it? Like, boxing's one of the biggest grifts in history. So, rule number one, you've got to find a group of people who believe in you. Rule number two, you have to be the reason for that group of people's happiness. Rule number yeah. three, they have to be loyal to you. And then number four, you have to make money off them. That's yeah. the four rules of the grift. And that's what he's doing. He's just grifting right now. Because what else is Dave going to do? The sky money is not that great. So you want to be getting yeah. those little percentage checks. And fair play to him. Like Dave's probably got a lot he can tell people about the business side of boxing because I'm sure he's had good deals and he's had bad deals. Mm. But 
as long as he's not training them, that's fine because, do you know what I mean? I don't know if he, he, if that's in his heart and I think he admitted that. So let, let's just see what Dave does. I'm not going to say Dave doesn't deserve a place in boxing. I think he does. I think he's an interesting voice to have in boxing. I just don't want to see him be, being a human punch bag. That's pretty much it. Yeah. All right, then. Yeah. Is Eddie Hearn phasing out Joe Gallagher, squeezing him by not giving him any slots for this stable so that his fighters leave him and go to Eddie's trainers? Because these trainers, when Eddie rings them and says, I've got an offer here for you, they go, yes, please, Eddie. You know, like blockbusters, yes, please, Bob. Whereas when he rings Joe, Joe probably goes, oh, no, I've got to get me a bit more money than that, Eddie. Might we know our fighters were. Do you feel a lot of that goes on in boxing? And do you feel that Joe's being squeezed out? So, so the first thing people need to understand, Hearn's not the best payer in boxing. Yeah, That's what people don't believe. They, they see how Eddie is. They see the matchroom shows looking slick and they assume fighters earn more money than they would anywhere else. Not true. Hearn's not a great payer. So oh. the problem you have with Joe, we've talked about this before us, he has expensive assets in his stable. Callum Johnson's expensive. Liam Smith is expensive. Callum Smith is expensive. Natasha Jonas is expensive. He's built really expensive assets. Put Liam Smith in there as well. And these are assets that need a live gate to justify spending money on them. Mm. That's the reason. He hasn't been frozen out. If you had crowds allowed in arenas now, all those Gallagher fighters would be fighting. All of them. But I do think there is a thing that goes around in boxing that Joe's difficult to deal with. And because of that, it's easy to throw rocks at him. But Joe Gallagher manages the people he trains. So Joe's batting for his people, which is what you should do. You should be getting the most money you can for your fighters. And it's up to Eddie to go, I'm going to start paying more money. Or just be honest and say, look, I'm not the best payer in boxing. And Joe Gallagher wants a fair deal for his guys. And we can't agree on numbers. Not don't don't be talking about Joe's difficult to deal with. He's not supposed to be easy to deal with, for God's sake. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, he is a trainer manager. He's going to do the best for his fighters, isn't he? I mean, he's been around the game, hasn't he? Forty odd years, he's been at it, hasn't he? Yeah, he knows what he's doing. He knows. And the thing is, I always say this. You, we, I sent you that voice note the other day, Russ. When it comes to boxing. You have to have control of something. Either you control the talent, you control the money, you control the distribution, right? If you control one of those three things in boxing, everyone has to come to your door. And Gallagher, as a trainer manager, Gallagher controls good fighters. At some point, you've got to knock on his door. So he knows eventually Hearn has to come to him because he's got too much talent. And that's my tip for anyone in boxing. Look at what you have today. If you don't have one of those three things, no one's going to take you seriously. Yeah, uh, looking at some statistics, in the last 15 years, the most champions from any gym in the country, it's uh, Joe G. Yeah, listen, he helped make Hearn credible. Like, he had that talent in his stable that was just ready at the right time. Two years before, two years after, you might not have had the same Eddie Hearn, but that he, they were the right people at the right time. Yeah. All right, then. Uh, Billy Joe Canelo. It's a nice juicy one for you. They're saying it's going to be 1st or 8th of May. So I can believe that. But if you're Billy Joe, don't you want to tune up before that? Yeah. And if so, where are you going to get the tune-up in? Well, Canelo's having a tune-up in. He's going to fight Eubanks leftovers from years ago. Oh, yeah, Yildrim. Yeah, quick, quick. Yeah, and the thing is, he's smart, right? It's a fight where he doesn't need a savage training camp. He'll probably do Yildrim in three or four rounds. Leaves him relatively fresh. And he can just carry on staying in camp until May. Yeah. Do you think it's a good fight, Billy against Canelo at 168? Or does Billy give his advantages away with weight? 
Uh, you all right, Cherry? So, at 168, I don't think Bill gets bigger. And I don't think he gets stronger, per se. I think he just gets more watery. Like, you don't see him bulging out of his skin at 168. Canelo is bulging out of his skin at 168. So, you know what I mean? Can he terrorize Bill to the body? Absolutely. Will Bill be able to get away? Um, to some extent, yeah, but Canelo's gonna work him hard, man. I don't I don't see Canelo losing. And I don't see Billy putting on that masterclass he did against Lemieux. Yeah, don't you? No, nah, I look, I think we're on the downward slope with Billy Joe. Yeah, I do. What's he now? 32, 33? 31. 32 in August, isn't he, I think? Yeah. So, we're, we're, just, we're just riding that downward slope. And I'm, fair enough, Bill, Bill probably just wants that Canelo fight. And then he'll, then he'll just do it for fun. Yeah. Yeah, all right then. Uh, Chisora Park has been spoke about on pay-per-view. Do you want to see it? <laughs> I can't. I can't help myself. Can I tell you? <laughs> you know, remember we talked before, and I I told you Joseph Parker would never win a British title. Yeah, never win a British title. He's not good enough. Dillian beats him. Joshua beats him. Fury beats him. Fury beats him. Joyce beats him. Dubois beats him. Nick Webb probably beats him. To be honest with you. Um, like, he's just not very good. He was lucky. Like, credit to Duco events for getting him where they got him. But he was lucky. And how bad was Ruiz that he couldn't take that title off him? Mm-hmm. Like, Joseph Parker is famous just for that that lucky win against Ruiz and that made his career. Oh, he's points. not that good. Yeah, he's not that. He He's a guy... In a more competitive era, we just call him a sparring partner. Like Takam. Takam was a career sparring partner before the heavyweight division got so bad that he just sort of rose up the rankings just by existing. So Parker versus Chisora means absolutely nothing to me. I don't I don't want to see it. I don't want to hear it. I'd quite like to see Chisora versus Brian Jennings. Like if they box anything oh, yeah. like they spar. Yeah, if you've ever seen them spar each other, I'm like, yeah, their styles come together perfectly. If, you, if you're going to make me watch a Chisora fight now, I know he's not going to win a world title. I just want a war. Three minutes of every round, just a war. For as long as it goes on, and I'm okay with that. Yeah. Uh, so, basically, does Derek beat Parker then? Ah, oh, man. Not necessarily. But I think... I think what's Chisora this year? 37, 38? Yeah, it's about 37, isn't it, I think? Come on, man. Like, you can't be... Nah. Ten losses, Terry. Ten losses. So the losses don't bother me, Russ, because for me, pay-per-view is about... It has to be a fight that's going to entertain me, and it has to be a fight that would justify paying both men a lot of money. Joseph yeah. Parker's not that fight for me. Brian Jennings isn't really that fight for me. Now, you whack your Sora in with... Uh, who could you put him in with? Put him in with Tony Yoka after Yoka's had his fight in March. Put him in with someone like a Yoka. I'm all right with that because at least at least that gives me something to look forward to after the fight. Mm. All right, then. Uh, is Tony Bellew the most annoying person in boxing? Recent polls suggested he is. Do you agree with those polls? Nah, 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 nah. I like Tony. I, I like Tony because Tony's just struggling with the fact that he's not relevant anymore. Do you think so? Yeah, he's struggling with that. You think for a while people wanted to know what Tony Bell you thought on all things boxing and, you know, when he was fighting, he was the centre of attention. Now he's just another face in the crowd. He's just another ex-boxer with an opinion. Yeah. And that's quite hard to adjust to. Like, you the, the limelight's no longer on you. You don't, you don't have that routine anymore. You don't have that pressure, that fear in you. So where does that energy go? 
I think it's just a struggle for him. I think it will take him a few years to adjust. I wouldn't be surprised if there's some, some kind of drink problem that creeps in at some point, and then we'll hear about the redemption tale. That might be on Matchroom's new channel. Then the comeback. So, oh, please, I hope not. Would you put it past him, Terry, to dig bell you up? Yeah, I think I think Tony's too. He's too smart and he's too experienced in the world of boxing to to do that. He won't want to tarnish his legacy. Like for God's sake, look, he built his legacy of someone who shouldn't have come back. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Well, the people say he's annoying, and the thumbnail on this video says Tony Bellio is annoying. <laughs> No, nah, but wait, 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 wait. Did he did he win helmets of the week or helmets of the month? No, he did. Uh, Steffi Ball, Terry Harper, and Eduardo Hearn. They won. Mate, where did you where where did you find that video of Steffi doing the twerking? He took it down, didn't he? But one of my friends saved it and sent me. I can't say who. I'll, <laughs> I'll tell you that offline. But uh, he took it down. Obviously, it come back to haunt him, hasn't it? Oh man, do you know? <laughs> Doing that in front of a man? Doing that in front of a man? Steffi Ball? Come on, eh? Who would have a show with you in your gym, mate, when you're doing that in front of men? Oh. <laughs> Working in front of a man in a pair of skimpy boxers? Come on, with crop top on. <laughs> That's not manly, is it, Steffi? Come see me. Uh, <laughs> I'll fight you for your watch, Steffi. My watch against your watch. Let's get at it. Let's do it for NHS and mental health. <laughs> oh, mate, you killed me. That, 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 that clip you found killed me. Well, blame the tech, guys. Listen, we don't get... Listen, we don't get our normal £1.50 foot video when we put that in, but it was well worth £1.50. <laughs> in fact we thought we'd lost it we had to dig, in, dig into archives <laughs> oh wow uh, alright then uh, uh, let me have a look Fury against Joshua now it's, what is it eight months since the uh, said it were done he said Daniel Kinahan well done damn the man Two fight deal. It is on. Eight months later, they haven't even got a date, and it's shrouded in mystery. What is going on, Terry? What's going on? Okay, so the easiest thing to do is to say to two guys, "Look, we're going to do two fights, fifty fifty, then sixty forty to the winner." Yeah. yeah, I'm all right with that. Yeah, I'm all right with that. Cool. Right, fight sorted. You two fight each other. They're the easiest things to sort out. Yeah. Now. Now you've got to sort out the logistics, right? Who's going to get what of the pie? Now, here's where it's going to get interesting. Who broadcasts it? I mean, who's going to put it on pay-per-view? What cut are you going to get? What are you going to give this person? What are you going to give that person? You know, is it a co-promotional deal? Who's going to carry the load on the cash? Where are you going to have the venue? What times are going to be shown? You know, who's going to be allowed to travel? If it's restricted numbers, who gets what numbers? Like, there's so many things that need to be sorted out and that are all contentious that yeah. you wouldn't conclude these negotiations anytime before April, May time, right? So then when's the earliest the fight can happen? It can't happen in June because Hearn has to do his Billy Joe Canelo work, right? If that's to be believed. He has to do the Billy Joe promotional work. So that would give you a month after Canelo Billy Joe to promote a June fight for Joshua Fury. So it's not going to happen then. It's not going to happen in July because we're all going to be away on our holidays and who's really going to want to watch boxing at that point? We're all going to be getting hammered, hopefully. So now you're looking at the fight happening in October, realistically. September, yeah. October time. That means Fury would have been out the ring, what, 18 months? Yeah. You think Fury's going to risk the biggest fight of his career? His dad, his, dad will make it, his dad will tell Tyson he's got to have a tune-up. Well, he has to have a tune-up. There's no question about it. Well, it's a year out of ring now, isn't it, Tyson, next week? Yeah. And then by, by September, October, Joshua would have been out of the ring as well. And you start to look at that and you go, 
2021 doesn't look realistic. 2022 looks more realistic. It's the year I've been saying for years now. That's when the fight would happen. You're saying it, you're saying it your age, don't you? Yeah, so 2022, that's when the fight will happen. And then they'll, they'll sell it by going, look, Josh is just going to deal with a couple of mandatories, and then that's all good. The interesting thing in all of this, Russell Hartley, Russell, 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 is what they do with Deontay Wilder. Yeah. Because if Wilder's going to fight Prince Charles Martin for that IBF number one spot, he puts pressure on Joshua and Fury. He puts pressure on Joshua by being his IBF mandatory, right? So Joshua now either has to fight Wilder or vacate. He still has the lawsuit over Fury, so he puts pressure on Fury from that side. Wilder becomes the most important man in all of this if he can fight Charles Martin. It's like chess. It's that one move Wilder needs to make, and then he calls the shots when the Fury-Joshua fight happens. And that's going to be interesting because that's a Heyman fight. Heyman can make Charles Martin versus Wilder anytime he wants. Yeah, it's going to be uh, interesting, isn't it? Exciting times exciting ahead. times in the Blue Ribbon division. Welcome back to the Blue Ribbon Division. It's great to have the heavyweights back, isn't it, Matt? Rough, tough, rugged. He's on shaky legs, Adam. He's on shaky legs. Sizzling added spice. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say one thing to John Fury, if you're going to fight Mickey Fio. Turn up! So that, I hope that fight's been agreed. Is that going to happen in Saudi or not? John Fury against Mickey Fee, I don't know. John Fury's not piped up for months, has he? I've silenced him. <laughs> you, don't, <laughs> you don't take me on, there, eh? John Fury, apologise for calling me a blowjob and I'll leave you alone. <laughs> well, no, no, it wasn't. No, no, no. It wasn't it you were Dennis Hobson's blowjob. And Peter Fury's blowjob. How insulting is that? Jesus. <laughs> I don't think people have ever seen me and Dennis when we've been out and we're at loggerheads and don't agree on anything. <laughs> no, well, well, that's all That's all for, for Jay McClory to do now. Yeah, good luck to him. He's going to need it. So, all right then. Uh, I think that's about it, Teddy. We'll wrap it up. We've had a... Uh, we've had hour a 10? Of, is that what we've had? An hour 10? Yeah, we've done... I don't uh, know. An hour, I mean, had an hour, we had an hour, so we've done really well. How are you coping down there in lockdown, Terry? Are you everything all right? Are you? Ah, oh, mate, like it's, it's, it's good now, it's good. Um, you're going out for obviously, food? Hmm? You're going out for food a lot? Well, takeaways. I mean, there's no restaurants open, Paul, because it's just <laughs> takeaways, uh, you know, just eat, delivery, Uber Eats. I mean, that's the upside of living in London, you get a lot of choice, so I can just cycle through it. Yeah, when I uh, was 16 and I worked on Hogarth Road, Hills Court, do you know where that is? O opposite the Hills Court tube station. I know exactly where you are, mate, yeah. I used to come, well, I used to work there. I, I left, obviously, I went, well, I left school and ended up in, it, well, it weren't Borstal then, it was Detention Centre. And when I came out, my dad went, get a job, you're going down south. So I, I went to stay with my auntie, but they got me a job at this hotel, Enterprise Hotel. It's still there to this day. And I used to, and obviously, like, you can imagine me in mid 80s, like, wow. I just went sightseeing everywhere, Madame Tussauds, Baker Street, went up there, yeah. Dungeons, went over Battersea Bridge, wow, Thames. But what I used to like about London was the smell of different food. I used to go down that. Out of Ogarth Road, and then you've got Hills Court Tube Station. There's a road, isn't there? A lot of Australians down there. Well, there's a road. Yeah. And all you've got is different types of food everywhere. And I'd be like on phone to my mum. Mum, they've got more than the Chinese down here. They've got Turkish. They've got uh, Indian food. They've got... Lebanese. Kebabs, Lebanese and American food. You name it. The food used to smell gorgeous. And you could not walk down there without just... Going in somewhere and buying somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> They've got more than a chippy down here, Bob, than a KFC. So, but many moons ago, but but yeah, so you're spoiled for choice down there, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. What I don't like about that place down there, I've been down there twice and I've had letters from Sadiq Khan. 
emissions, uh, dark congestion, tunnel, charge. congestion charge. Pay now, Porky, it's 200 quid. If not, it can go up to 800. I'm like, what? And they don't, they don't, you know, like years ago, what we do up north, if you go over Umber Bridge, there's a bloke there and he takes your money, you know, like a toll. Yeah. Oh, we went through Dartford Tunnel and I thought, well, there's nobody taking money. So you just carry on. You get it in post, don't you, Bill? <laughs> it's craziness, mate. How can, <laughs> how can you live like that down there, mate? Anybody... Mate, I just drive, but Russ, I just drive with your number plates on, mate. Ah, thanks a lot, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. That's what friends like you who, who needs enemies. So, all right. <laughs> But listen, we, we, we've corrected a lot of <laughs> batteries have gone. Ah, oh, that's a that's backfired <laughs> on me, hasn't it? Hey, there's going to be a new account set up. Porky's missing batteries. Porky's missing batteries. Oh my God, what are we going to do? I was supposed to say. Oh, we got a bit of a squeak out of it. Take precautions. Are you ready? We've just corrected the... There you go. <laughs> Finally. Batteries are going though on it. I've admitted it that much in the last three years. <laughs> so, wait then, Terry, listen, I'm going to get off, but listen, it's been great having you on. I know you're going to get some food now, aren't you? Uh, no, I'd probably just go for a walk, mate. get my 10,000 steps in. Oh, dedicated. Mate, you mean, you know... So you got the gastric band, mate. I haven't got a gastric band, so this is how I've got to keep the weight off. Oh, well, it's, I've cheated dinner. I'm a cheat. <laughs> <laughs> so, listen, you take care, mate. Thanks for coming you too, on. Mate. Have a fantastic no weekend. Cheers, you too, pal. mate. Speak to you soon, all right? All right. All right. Oh, that was... Uh, that was my good friend, Terry, from London. I've known him a while now, I think. I think I've known Terry six years now. Six years this year. Yeah, I started with Dennis April 2015. I think he came to a show that year, later on in the year. So I've known him about six years. Good boxing bloke, trainer. Got a good job. I actually saw Terry on a video the other day that went out to do a boxing. It looked like it was a Zoom thing with some, something to do with his job or something. I thought, go on, Terry. I like to see people doing well. That's unless it's Eddie Earn. So that's about it. Eddie knows I love him, really. Uh, I think that's about it for today. It's uh, 2.35 on a Friday. And I'm just going to get this uploaded now and premiered. So that'll be 3 o'clock when I leave here. And that leaves me with one to do tonight. Chris Ward at 7 p.m. Chris Ward, I forgot about him. Friday night. Should be going out tonight, shouldn't I? But when days are gone, aren't they? The going out days. It's uh, stay in, pay all your money up, go get your teeth done. And that as well, haven't we? That's what I've saved for my teeth. I would have only shoved up my nose, wouldn't I? So that's about it then. So peace out, keep on trucking, keep supporting boxing. Don't forget to like and subscribe and leave a comment. Good or bad, leave one. All right, but don't don't be phoning me, all right? Because if you phone and you're leaving the messages, and the, and the not so nice messages at all. There might come a time where I don't come and pick this phone up. If somebody else picks it up, they might want to deal with it a bit differently. All right, no, I'll take it as well, leave it at that. You've got it out of your system. So, but if you do that, and like I said, I don't come in, because some days I'll just pull a quote of me out, so not today. Uh, you get yourself in trouble if you phone off your phone, won't you? Because they won't mess about here. Like, whereas me, I'm a bit more, I don't like to see anybody get into jail. It's like having a big cloud on your jail. It's not good. All right? So have a great weekend. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. All right. And just be kind. Be nice to people this weekend. And watch Porky's Corner. Peace out. <laughs>